Thank you, Dean. <laughs> well, good morning. Out of the blue, a couple in their 60s is visited by a fairy who informs them that she can grant each of them a wish. Well, the wife knows right away what she wants, so she just comes out and says, I want to spend the rest of my life traveling around the world in luxury with my darling husband. The husband says, sorry, but I want a wife who's 30 years younger than me. So the fairy waves her wand, and lo and behold, the wife finds herself on a luxury liner, an ocean liner, with her darling husband, who is now 94 years old. <laughs> Careful what you wish for. <laughs> so today, I wanted to look at this idea of our inner critic. Does anyone have like an inkling, bit of a clue, what I might be talking about? You know, that voice within us that just loves to tell us what losers we are. You know, how horrible we've been, how we'll just never amount to anything, and why would we even consider that? And you know, that same inner critic is the voice of anger, hatred, and contempt of others out there. And you know, why this is important for us to look at is in Science of Mind, we teach that how we see things, what we believe, what we're telling ourselves about ourselves, about others, about the world, about life, has a direct bearing on how we experience life. You know, we teach that God's nature, God's goodness and lovingness and wholeness is ever-present everywhere in the universe. Everything is created out of God's nature, including us. But it's only experienced by us to the degree that we can sense it, that we can perceive its presence in ourselves and others, that we can sense that it's out there. Even when the world doesn't really reflect its nature, we know that there's an underlying potential of goodness lying there. And so, in a sense, there's, there's an inner dialogue that's constantly running through our minds that's you know, basically saying what we think, what we're perceiving about what's going on, how we feel about that. And clearly, I think we can all admit that that dialogue, that inner voice, isn't always speaking in a way that reflects a sense of God's goodness at the center of ourselves and everything and everyone. And so, see, it's this false sense of separation from God that gives rise to fear-based thoughts, feelings of lack and limitation, and these, in turn, lead to behaviors, to conditions in the world that don't reflect the nature of God's goodness, discord disease, disenfranchisement, the acts of hate that we witness in the world, that we've you know, been so focused on recently in our country, in our own backyard recently in Thousand Oaks. You know, these, these situations arise from a belief in duality. You know, if we, if we felt our connection with that goodness, God's nature that's in us, that's greater than any condition in the world, and felt that underlying connection with all beings, if we really felt that we all reside within this one vast ocean of God's love and on the unseen side of life, we're interconnected, these acts of violence, of discord, they would just cease to be. We couldn't feel that and wish to do harm upon anyone or anything. So our work in consciousness is to look beyond any sense of duality to cultivate that greater sense of God's ever-presence in ourselves, in everything, in everyone. It's a pretty simple principle, isn't it? You know, it is, it's pretty simple. God is in everything. Ernest Holmes, our founder, gave a charge to ministers that we have one thing to teach every time we get up here in the pulpit is that God is all there is and that God is in everything. It's a pretty simple concept, not necessarily easy 
to apply and to put into practice, is it? I mean, I think it's really difficult for us to wrap our minds around this idea that God is at the center of everything, including what we would label the horrible stuff out there. Now, I would say that as hard as it is to accept God's presence in natural disasters, like we're seeing unfolding right now with the fires uh, that are burning right now uh, and those who are suffering because of that, I think on some level we can understand that, okay, we live in natural settings and nature goes through cycles. And so we are going to be exposed to those cycles. So I think there can be some understanding that, okay, this happens. And at least for me, I find it fairly easy to see God in these situations as the outpouring of love and the caring and the way people will do whatever they have to do, make sacrifices to help those who are in need in these situations in our congregation. I've heard of people who have gone out of their way to help those who have been affected by these fires. But I think when it comes down to looking at where humans consciously you know, do acts of harm to others, where we harm others and we're aware of it, that, that can really, really be hard for us to accept that God is somehow present in that. And so, you know, I think we ask ourselves, well, where's God? Where's God in this? And one of the things that has helped me really to grapple with this idea and to get a sense of God being present in these situations came from the Dalai Lama when he made a statement in his book, Ethics for a New Millennium, that all human actions, even those that do harm, are based on a desire to be happy, to feel good, to be free from suffering. So see, that impulse, even when we're doing harm, somehow comes from a feeling that we'll feel good if we do that. And the impulse to experience good is God's nature in us, but it can be twisted into something unlike its pure intention due to our feelings of separateness. You know, when we're coming from a consciousness of my good versus your good, well, that can lead to greed, that can lead to withholding. My power versus your power can lead to acts of violence. You know, my good, but this false sense of not being worthy can translate into not accepting, not being open to good that's available to us. But if we trace it back to the Im original impulse for good and to know that the highest good is a good that is for all and never against anyone, then we can see where we got off track and where we can make changes and realign with the pure good that is a good for all. Now, what's interesting is I think because so much of our attention is on the world of effects out there, we have a tendency to look at the discordant conditions in the outer world, you know, to just say, oh, isn't it awful how people are treating each other and how people are talking to each other and all of this, you know, hate and violence and all of this and not recognize how these things that we find so objectionable exist within us. I remember a therapist that was addressing a group of people at a conference that was, you know, with the theme of it was, you know, to bring greater peace into the world, how to do that. And one of his statements was, how can we expect to see greater tolerance, greater love, greater collaboration in the world when we can be so unloving and unkind with ourselves, the way we talk to ourselves? Which brings us back to this idea of the inner critic. You know, if it's always about going back and finding God, where's God in the inner critic? And again, if, it, if we trace this back to the impulse to feel good, to thrive, this is a voice that wants us to do better. It wants us to not fail, not be disappointed, 
avoid getting hurt. You know, and I think we internalize this voice from the time when we were very, very young. Because even if we had the most loving parents, there were times that when we were doing something that was inappropriate, something that might do us harm or do harm to others, we were scolded, right? And we took that scolding voice as a voice that keeps us on track. And I think we've taken the scolding voice, that voice that makes us feel demeaned and degraded, to a whole new level when we sense that we haven't shown up at our best or when we're trying to avert some potential problem. That, no, don't do that. What do you think you're doing? That voice is really a voice that's just trying to keep us on track with us coming from a place of fear. And the stress, the emotional suffering that we incur from this harsh, this uh, demeaning voice, I believe this is a signal to encourage us to alter the tone of the voice, which guess what, folks? We can do that. We absolutely can do that. You know, it's, it's on us to find a way to recognize where we're not living up to our divine potential or recognize where we might need to check in with what we're going to do and the consequences without being so harsh on ourselves. And so when I think about this, I find that a great model of what it is we, we would like to develop inwardly instead of this harsh critic is a coach. What if the critic became more of a coach? Because ideally, a great coach is one who sees our greater potential in whatever area he or she is coaching us in and encourages us to step into that potential. The coach isn't always saying, oh, it's great, you're great, everything's fine. I mean, certainly, yes, when we're doing well, the coach cheers us on. But when there's room for improvement, the coach would be one that would help us to see where we're going off track give us some pointers on how to do better going forward. Let us know, you know, if, if you do that, here might be the consequence. Why don't you try this instead? The coach is an encouraging voice. You know, while the demeaning critic might cry out, you know, you screwed up, you're such a loser. The coach might say, okay, you know, here's where you missed the mark. Here's where you went off track, but don't worry. We'll get back on track. Try doing this. Do you see how it's the same basic intention, but it's just coming through a different way, how the critic can actually be a coach? Does that make sense? Good, because I didn't want to start all over. It's <laughs> so how do we get back on track? How do we go from that harsh critic and transform that into more of a coach. Well, I think the first thing is we have to be willing to listen to the voices, the voices of fear. You know, no, no, what do you think you're doing? You know, just be willing to listen and say, well, what, what's that fear about? You know, what is it that I'm telling myself here that really doesn't reflect the truth of God's presence in me? But, but what is the fear? Is there anything I can take from that that might be of value? Because then, once the voice is heard, it's more likely to soften. Have you noticed, if you ignore people who are yelling at you, they're just going to keep yelling? You know, but usually the yelling voice wants to be heard. And the best practice for us to do that, to become accustomed to listening, is meditation. Because in meditation, we have the ability to just sit and observe try to just move into a place of non-judgment and see what's going on in our minds. And you know, when we're in that place, when we start to hear these fear-based thoughts, you know, just ask, you know, what's the voice saying? What, what am I telling myself here? And sometimes journaling, I find, is very helpful to journal. What are the thoughts that the, the uh, critic is throwing out there? Like, if you do that, you know, you're going to be ruined for life. Don't be stupid with your money. Well, 
okay, wait a second. Good point. I want to be a good steward of my money. Let's, let's, I hear you there. Now let's look at the situation. You know, can I check in and make sure I'm being a good steward? You know, it's just about asking what viewpoint is a voice trying to get me to hear that might be a value? What fear might I want to address so that it can be more about, hey, so you're planning on doing this. Have you really checked if this is a good thing to do at this time? I had a client some time ago who came to me who was in absolute emotional torment about not having called a friend. His friend's husband and her children had been killed in a car accident. And this client couldn't bring herself to call, and she felt just absolutely tortured for you know, not having done that. And so when we explored the inner dialogue that was going on in her mind, we discovered that there was this one voice that was yelling, now, what on earth could you say to make things better? You know, you can't fix this. What if you say something trite? You know, and then another voice was yelling at her about what a horrible friend she was being for not reaching out. And so as we looked for, you know, okay, what the God qualities that these voices, if we trace it back to God, and we looked at it and we said, okay, well, there's this, obviously there's a lot of caring behind this. This one voice is saying, be sensitive to your friend. You know, maybe avoid just platitudes like, oh, it'll all be fine one day. I mean, there really is no way to fix this. So try to be sensitive to her needs and what, what you're saying. That was worth hearing. And, you know, when we brought the voice down to the coach, the, the coach on the other side was just saying, look, you, there may be nothing you can say to fix it, but she needs to know you're there. Just reach out. Just reach out. So both of these voices had value. And once we saw that this was all coming from love, we were able to come together and pray, knowing that love was surrounding and filling this entire situation, that love would guide her when she reached out, when she moved past her fears and contacted her friend. And indeed, when she called, which she felt wonderful about being able to do, she was just moved to say, I know there's absolutely nothing I can say or do to fix this. The only thing I can offer is I'm there for you. I'm there for you. I'm praying for you. Anything I can do for you, let me know. And because it was so heartfelt and so sincere, it absolutely was felt and uplifted and brought comfort to her friend. We're all on a path of discovering and bringing forth the divine potential within us. And guess what, folks? We all fail to live up to that potential in some ways at different times. Don't you deserve to be guided through the ways you can improve, that you can step into a greater potential a greater expression of your divine potential in a loving, encouraging way? Let me answer that one for you. Yes, <laughs> you do. Yes, you do. We all do. So I suggest let's start creating that experience for ourselves by coaching our inner critic into becoming the coach that brings the best out of us. You know, as we do that for ourselves, it's easier then to direct that mindset toward the world out there. We can be more of a presence that coaches and supports the potential for good that lies in every situation versus criticizing and condemning what's wrong. And I think the world would welcome more of that consciousness. Let's pray. And so as we turn our attention inward, let's just connect right here, right now with that part of us that just 
wants to feel good, to be at peace, to see goodness unfolding around us, and to recognize that as the impulse of that one life, that one power, that presence of God, that is goodness in every way it can be known, felt, and realized. And that presence is a presence that always, always remains a vibration of love. No matter how much we may feel separate from it and go against its nature, it holds everything in love and is always there to guide us back to that higher experience and expression of love. And so in this moment, let us just align with that love and give thanks to all the veterans on this Veterans Day holiday, just giving thanks for the ways that they have made sacrifices, which is an energy of love for us. Let us feel that vibration of love and for those who have been impacted by the violence in our own neighborhoods or anywhere in the world, let us absolutely know that God's love is bigger than that, that they are held in love, that everything, everything eventually comes back to love. And for those who are being affected by the fires right now, let us absolutely surround them with a vibration of love, knowing that as we are all interconnected, they can feel it, they can know that on some level, as hard as this may be now, this too shall pass. And we are there to see them through it. And so we bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. And we absolutely know that our prayer is a blessing for any place in the world where people are forgetting their oneness with God. We know that God is there to be revealed. And so with just a heart just filled, filled with gratitude for knowing that God is in every moment, every situation, every being. I release this word knowing it is so, I let it be, and so it is. Together we say, Amen.